thank you, thank you to, to Ty. Thank you for, for all of you for coming out this evening. You know, as Jay mentioned, we appreciate you coming out through the rain, you know, and, and have a chance to, to meet with you all. Um, we're, we're looking forward to this evening of going over some topics in, in immigration, most specifically the EB-5 program. Talk to you a little bit about the, the current uh, just landscape uh, of that, um, of our industry, and uh, and to, to kind of have a chance to, to go over some questions and answers at the end of the program to, to give you a chance to, to make sure that all of your inquiries are, are heard from. So Jay had, had mentioned a little bit, but I'm gonna reintroduce everyone to my far left. We've got Abi Loya. Abi works with us at Can-Am Investor Services. He is our director of South Asia and the Middle East and specifically spends quite a bit of time in India working on that market for us. Uh, to his right, we have Mr. Nilesh Shaw. Nilesh lives here. He is a uh, manager of business development for Can-Am Investor Services and an EB-5 investor himself. So he, he brings a very unique uh, story to be able to, to share about his, his experiences. Now, we're, we're very appreciative of having Mr. Uh, Robert Devine here. Robert is here from Chattanooga, Tennessee. He is a partner at Baker Donaldson and a former director of USCIS. And to my immediate uh, left is uh, Ms. Crystal Osmond, partner at Miller Mayer, and also one of the preeminent immigration attorneys in the EB-5 field and just in, in the field of immigration in general. So what I'd like to start us off with here, hopefully that, that brought up our first slide, uh, is to talk a little bit about the, the current state of, of just immigration and the climate that, that we're seeing in the, in the current presidential administration. So what we hear often is, is from people who come into us and they'll say, well, I'm hearing this or I'm hearing that. What does this mean in, in actual practice? What, what does this mean for for me, if I'm looking to, to be immigrating to the United States, what's what I'm reading in the news mean for, for all of this and, and how would it impact me? So I'd like to start with, with Robert. Robert, if you'd like to just kind of talk to us a little bit about, about some of the things that maybe you get asked about from, from your client base and, and what that typically means in a real practical sense for, for them and, and their, their immigration. Okay. You know, I think that we all have uh, people we know who have experienced more problems of late with uh, immigration filings, particularly H-1Bs and L-1s and related filings. And I think it's easy to assume that the government just doesn't like immigration anymore and these people are just out to keep everybody out. And it's, it's not that simple. Um, to me, first, there's a recognition that there has been a significant amount of abuse of the program where people who really were not qualified had filings made for them that were not true. And, and I, I can tell you, I have seen, having been on the government side of that, it's, 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 um, it's amazing how much of that there has been that I didn't know about as a private practitioner before because I didn't have anything to do with things like that. But there, there has been a significant amount, and I would say particularly in the IT staffing business, there have been a lot of misrepresentations about what people were doing and what they were getting paid and what, they, uh, what postings had been made and all kinds of things. And the government has decided you know, we're going to look into these things and we're going to investigate where we have suspicion and we're going to crack down. And that's a lot of what's been happening. But then there has been, of course, the policy push from this buy American, hire American um, uh, executive order that President Trump issued. And that has pushed its way down into some interpretations uh, particularly about H-1B and this idea of what is specialized knowledge that is required for H-1B and what kind of connection does there have to be between the uh, degree that somebody has and the duties of the job that they're performing. How tight does that connection have to be? And that's been the biggest interpretational piece that has caused 
the most trouble. And I think that in many respects, the government is just wrong about that. And there are increasingly uh, many lawsuits challenging that approach. And we'll see if um, that actually gets uh, pushed back meaningfully or not. We've seen in so many other areas where the Trump administration has taken uh, aggressively negative approaches about certain areas related to immigration that don't really relate to business, um, where they've been sued and successfully sued. And that, that kind of takes a while in this context, and we'll see. Uh, but there have been some other issues. I, I, I guess from my point of view as a practitioner, filing legitimate cases, I haven't seen so many cases get denied, but it just takes a lot more effort to get one approved. And it just ends up costing me and my clients more time and money to get those things approved. And when it is approvable, it's annoying to have to go through that exercise. But I guess the government's attitude, and I've heard this expressed from the current director, whom I know pretty well, and who used to work for me when I was there. And he, his attitude is not anti-immigration. It's that we should only be granting benefits to people who are actually eligible for them. And they're required to prove to us that they are eligible. But you know, when you're starting to talk about what kind of degree does this job really require? And what exactly are the duties? Or is this job really mostly managing other people for an L1 or EB1C. These are really, um, you know, it's hard to parse those things out and it gets to be annoying to have to, to deal with that. But I, that, that's the way I see it for now. Sorry to blab on too long. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, Crystal, do you want to touch on some of your experiences? With uh, I mean, I would agree with Robert. I think that, um, uh, there's a lot more uncertainty, if you will, when filing an immigration case these days. Um, and that stems from uh, recent adjudication trends that um, unfortunately are sometimes published, sometimes unpublished, um, that affect the way we put a case together. Um, as Robert says, we see I would say in almost all types of employment-based cases, um, and particularly the ones that you're probably most familiar with, a lot more RFEs, um, sometimes uh, denials, um, not all the time, but um, it does happen. In particular, in the L1B context, the EB1C context, I would say that certainly um, in almost all cases, unless you're filing for a very well-known company, you're going to get an RFE um, questioning the basis of your filing. Um, in the H-1B context, USCIS issues a lot more RFEs now on things like specialty occupation, as Robert says, and also on things like whether you're being paid an appropriate wage. Um, and often also on more inconsequential things like, do you have enough work for a certain employee for three years, um, which um, seems a bit ridiculous since not that many people I know hire employees they don't intend to actually provide with work. Um, even in other green card categories like EB1A, which is for extraordinary ability aliens, we see cases that used to just sail right through getting RFEs. Um, so I think that there's just a lot more uncertainty when putting together filings. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Um, Abhi, Melish, you guys have anything to, to add on uh, what, what you're hearing from the people that you're speaking to? Abhi? Sure. Um, <laughs> I think people all, all over the world are paying more attention to the president's tweets instead of facts. And, uh, uh, and while there's a lot that a president can do, like pass executive orders, recently there was a tweet about fast tracking green cards or for H-1Bs and citizenship at all. I mean, all that cannot be done unilaterally. That requires vote of the Congress, and I think off late, a lot of people just pay more attention to tweets, and we get questions relating to that. Hey, I'm on an H-1B, and you know what? Everything is good. I'll get a green card really quickly. 
that's not the case. Nothing has changed, and the recent tweet that we received, I mean, uh, that was there, that has not changed anything. It's the same thing. It was stating the obvious, just that people just feel the attitude has changed, but that doesn't necessarily change the timelines to get a green card. Great. Great. Well, I think we'll move on to our, our next slide here. Um, you know, we, we touched upon a few things. Uh, we we kind of want to talk a little bit about just some of the other, how EB-5 would compare to some of the other potential visa options that might be out there. Um, Crystal, I know you had touched upon a few different visa classes that, that people might be, be on, they might be looking at. Um, for someone who is on a, an L1 or an H1B, is EB-5 a good pathway for them to try and move forward? Would, would EB-5 be good for you know, a tech worker you know, or, or, or you know, a, an entrepreneur that, that's looking to, to look for a pathway to, to immigration? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I would say that most um, people who are in that potential category are people who are currently, maybe even have a green card application filed or approved in EB-2, in EB-3, and are currently just waiting, waiting to get a green card. Um, the benefit of EB-5 is that at least right now, um, India EB-5 in particular is not backlogged. And while it is expected that perhaps in the coming year um, there might become a waiting line for Indian EB-5 <clears throat> applicants, um, it certainly isn't going to compare to the line for EB-2 and EB-3. Um, you know, I read a recent report that was produced that said, you know, the waiting line, if they really took into consideration how EB-2 and EB-3 have been moving, that it would be a potentially a 50-year wait for people in that category um, if it actually moved at the rate that it has been as of recently. So that's, that's a long time. <laughs> now, whether that actually plays out, it's still a pretty lengthy wait, as many of you are familiar with. Um, EB-5, at least for the foreseeable future, again, there's not a backlog, and <clears throat> It is not anticipated that even if there were one, that it would be as long as, say, EB-2 or EB-3. Um, also, you know, even if you had a petition that was already pending or approved, um, an EB-5 application is not going to interfere with um, another application, uh, meaning you can pursue a green card on multiple pathways at one time. Um, so certainly it is a more than a feasible option. I would say it's something you would more um, particularly maybe if you have kids who are at risk of aging out, meaning no longer able to be a dependent on your green card because um, they might be turning 21 soon. Um, it's probably something you most certainly want to consider, um, you know, even if you have an approved green card application in another category. Let me just put a gloss on that. So the obvious choices are, you know, moving from H-1B to EB-2 and 3. Then maybe if some, is that still working? Yeah. Maybe um, if you feel like you're big time, then, you know, EB-1 or uh, uh, for extraordinary ability may be a possibility. Uh, but, uh, you know, even a waiting list is, is developing in that category and the government's approach to adjudications is narrowing some. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, if you happen to have uh, organized a business outside the United States uh, and still have it, then you could try to transfer yourself within the U.S. I mean, within that multinational company, you know, to some business that you buy or establish here. But the government's attitude about those particular kinds of cases, small company transfers for EB1C are being looked at extremely narrowly. That's probably the tightest, uh, the place where the screws are being tightened the most on an adjudication level. Their attitude is just this category was not made, was not meant for moving within little companies and especially to a little company here. Um, and. And so, I mean, the line is much shorter for EB-1, but it's harder to get. 
um, hey, go for it, give it a try, see if you can get it. But meanwhile, uh, EB-5 is something to consider. A lot of people have been here a lot of years and have made some money, um, or they've been sending home money uh, you know, back to their home country and have family who may be able to send some back here to help uh, push that, that process um, to be able to make that $500,000 investment. I do think we have to recognize that just as the real waiting list for a new person entering trying to get EB2 or 3 is much longer than you would think looking at the visa bulletin. The waiting list for people born in India is going to be in existence by the time anybody who files now would be adjudicated. Um, there will be a waiting list in, for India and a new investor can expect to wait five, six years for that visa number. You just need to realize that Nobody wants to sell a, a, an investment to somebody who's misunderstanding what's going to happen. And if you've got a 19-year-old child, then an EB-5 investment for uh, people born in India is not a plan for that 19-year-old. And you know, you've got options to maybe give an investment to the child and let them be an investor. And we've got, we've certainly been plowing that field with the Chinese nationals who are subject to a much longer waiting list tons of cases for very young Chinese investors uh, so it is possible to do we've gotten approvals of this um, immigration is uh, or for that matter any visa is uh, based on personal circumstances of everyone EB5 is just a means to an end and and being green card and citizenship and uh, it just depends whether, uh, based on your per personal circumstances, it's right or, right or not. Uh, I believe most people that work here want to eventually get a green card. And if your children are aging out or may age out in the next five to six years, EB-5 is a good option uh, for them to, to be able to get a green card along with parents. Um, also, it, I mean, it's, again, Whatever that green card means to you and the time frame of getting that green card uh, will drive the decision to get a, a green card through EB-5 or EB-2 or EB-3. And honestly, the wait times for EB-2 and EB-3 are so long that there's a possibility that if you have a child who's a US citizen, that child turns 21 and sponsors you as a parent before you get your EB-2 or EB-3 green card. Okay. That's a, that is not at all a joke. Yeah. I mean, that kid who's born tomorrow yeah. could, could end up sponsoring somebody for citizenship before that parent starting today could get a, a, a green card under the EB-2 or 3 born in India. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. So, so, I mean, the point is, sure, EB-5 may not be immediate as it, as it looks, Look at the visa bulletin. It showed it was current until this month, where it looks unavailable because the law is temporarily expired. Um, but it's a lot faster. EB5 for India is a lot faster than EB2 or three for India, right. big time, and it's going to stay that way. Right. Flip to our next year. I, I think. Um, I think all of these points lead very nicely in, into maybe a quick, just a quick talk about the actual process and requirements of EB-5. Um, because, you know, when, when we talk about, when we talk about it as an option, everyone's now hearing that, yes, it's a very viable option for someone in not knowing what your circumstances are for, for moving forward, that it should be something that, that should at least be considered. That being said, it's not necessarily an option for everyone. There are some certain fundamental eligibility requirements that, that you should be aware of when you're considering this before you start to move forward. Uh, I think it's also important to, to hear about some of these timeframes because we've alluded to how 
long some of these other visa classes might take to get to, to the path that you're looking for. Well, when we talk about the EB-5 process, how long does that take and, and the different steps that we go along to, to get there? So Avi, do you want to just talk us through maybe a little bit of, of the actual requirements of, of, for someone who is going through an EB-5 investment? Sure. Um, EB-5, uh, simply put, is investing capital and creating American jobs. Um, there are two investment amounts, half a million and a million dollars, depends on where you invest. Uh, if you invest in a targeted employment area, that is either an area of high unemployment or a rural area, then the investment amount is half a million. And in any region outside, area outside of that, the investment amount is a million dollars. The process uh, starts with hiring an attorney because your source of funds need, need to be documented. Every dollar that you're investing, you need to have a proper trail from dollar one to dollar half a million. So an, an immigration attorney helps you with that. Uh, an immigration attorney also helps you with shortlist, shortlisting projects because the first step uh, in this uh, whole uh, EB-5 process is filing application for conditional green card or form I-526. At that stage, USCIS is looking at two things. One, whether your source of funds are cl clean and explainable, and second, whether the project on the face of it meets the requirements of immigration law. That on an average uh, takes, it takes around 22 months currently on an average uh, to get approved or adjudicated. Now there's a big standard deviation because there are projects that I know of recently that have received approvals in eight to 12 months. And then I know of projects that have received approvals in three plus years. Um, so it's very hard to predict when that application will get adjudicated. Once you get an approval, if you're here in the States, then uh, just like EB2 or EB3, you file an application for adjustment of status, I-485, uh, which again varies from where you are in the United States, can take anywhere from six to 10 months, uh, sometimes longer. And if you're outside of the United States, you have to go to your local consulate for uh, an interview. And in India, it's Delhi and Mumbai. Those are the only two consulates that issue immigrant visas. Once you get your uh, approval and go for your interview, uh, that's when you get your conditional green card. Once you get a conditional green card, you have to maintain, uh, you have to be a conditional permanent resident for at least one year and nine months and then you file an application for removal of conditions. Removal of conditions are, now this is all about the project, whether your funds were invested and at least 10 jobs per investor were created. Um, so the regional center provides data of you know, the job creation and it, it is W-2s, uh, the spending on the project, et cetera. And that application is again filed by an immigration attorney and again, it takes around 20 to 24 months on an average to get approved. So, and during this time, you are eligible to receive your money back. So if the project has gone on as planned, uh, in five to seven years time, your principal is returned to you. So overall, it's a five to seven year cycle and currently it takes around two to two and a half years to get your green card. Great. Thank you, Avi. And one thing I think might be worthwhile because, Robert, you had, you had alluded to, uh, for say, an investor who was, who was investing for a 19-year-old uh, and how that might be a difficult thing for that 19-year-old who would be a derivative of that petition for them coming forward. Um, I think it might be worthwhile just to, to, to give people a little bit of, 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 of concept to what that is. And, okay. And, so this thing about children aging out is kind of complicated and I'm just going to apologize about it and try to short circuit. I, I could bore you with a lot of detail and I'll try not to because Peter will hurt me if I do. But the general rule is that a child has to be under 21 years of age at the time of actually getting the green card in order to be eligible to derive that green card from the parent who is the one who's principally eligible. And we frequently refer to that person as the principal alien and the spouse and the children as derivatives. There's an exception to that rule. The child could actually be more than 21 when the parent gets a green card under the rules of the Child Status Protection Act. 
And basically that law says that during the time that the petition is pending, so in EB-5, that's the I-526 petition where you're showing here's the project that I invested in, it qualifies, and here's where my money came from, and it's good money. While that's pending, the kid's adjusted age is frozen. So if the kid was 19 at the time that that I-526 was filed, the kid is considered to stay 19 during the whole, and be 19 at the end of the, the two year period that it typically takes to get that I-526 adjudicated. So that kid's adjusted age is still 19. But the problem, if, if a visa number is then not available when that petition is approved, then the kid resumes aging, starts getting older again from that point. So if the 19 year old who, the person who was 19 years old when the I-526 was filed, if that family has to wait for more than two years for a visa number after the I-526 is approved, then that child would become adjusted age 21 and would no longer be eligible to derive the green card once a visa number became available. This is the same rule that applies in I-140s and I-130s. It's the same rule, so there's nothing unique about that. It's just that here we're trying to anticipate a waiting list that we know is going to be there because we can see the numbers coming through the system, um, and we can't see it and feel it because when we look at the visa bulletin, it doesn't show up there. With EB-2 and 3, we've gotten used to this phenomenon because we know that the waiting line is a lot longer than the you know, eight or ten years that it may look like in the visa bulletin today. Is that, does that does that kind of get it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so yeah. I, I, um, I was just going to add that, and that doesn't necessarily mean that EB five isn't an option for you. Um, you might just have to strategize in a different way. So, for example, if you're someone who is lucky enough to have an EB two petition already approved and your employer is willing to continue sponsoring you for your H-1B extensions each year, then perhaps that's still the green card route for you. Um, but maybe then your child, who's maybe 19, 20, that particular individual might be the better option for to be the principal applicant on the I-526 petition. And you might say, well, where's my son going to get that money from? Well, you're permitted to gift your child that money. Um, so <clears throat> again, it might not be the case that you switch everybody to EB-5. It might be that you need to develop a different immigration strategy for different family members. Hey, one other point because I know a lot of people here are familiar with the phenomenon that if you have locked in a priority date, a place in the queue based on the filing of a PERM or an I-140 based on the employer showing no American available and all that, then if you later get an I-140 from a different employer, you get to hang on to that original place in the queue established by the first employer. That rule does not cross over to EB-5. So if you had an I-140 or a PERM filed for you a few years ago, that's your priority date for any I-140. It's not your priority date for the I-526 and your path there. Um, I'd just like to add to this. Uh, it is almost impossible. Well, retrogression is coming to EB-5. It's almost impossible to predict when it'll happen and how severe it'll be. And it's because unlike other visa categories, EB-5 petitions, like I mentioned, have a big standard deviation in the average processing time. So just because of that, um, if you file today and say that project gets an approval in 8 to 12 months, you're way ahead in the queue as opposed to someone who files today and gets an approval in three years' time. So that sort of makes it really unpredictable um, if uh, or how badly uh, retrogression will affect you. Great. And, and one last thing I, I would like to, to clarify is the, the EB-5 investments that we're talking about, when we talk about EB-5, it's almost always talking about a regional center investment. 
as opposed to, say, a direct investment? Because that is a question that gets, uh, that gets mentioned to us often, especially, especially, say, in a group of, of entrepreneurs or, or whatnot who might come in and say, yes, this sounds great. Um, I'd like to invest $500,000 into my business, into my tech startup, and, and attach my immigration to it as well. That, that is something that you could discuss, that you could look forward to, but when we, when we talk about an EB-5 investment, what we're almost always talking about is a regional center investment. So. Hey, more than 95% of EB-5 bonds are based on a regional center investment. Very few are the other. And I would say of the ones that aren't, the rate of denial is staggeringly higher for the non-regional center investments than for others for a whole host of reasons. I mean, I'm not saying they can't be approved, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong with a kind of a private investment. I mean, hey, it can be done. I've had clients who do it. We set them up. We can, we can run it. But statistically, that's not been the plan. Right. Um, Indians tend to file a high volume of direct EB-5 petitions. And India is the second highest filers, a filer of EB-5 currently. Also, India has the highest denial rate. It's 87%, whereas on an average, uh, uh, Vietnam or China has around 90 plus percent approval rate. The, what you just said was an approval rate, not a denial rate. Right, just right, 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 yes, yes. Yeah, I would say in respect of when you're choosing between a direct EB-5 investment, whether it's your own company or your friends, um, as between that and a regional center, there's really two main things that usually come into play. One is, of course, job creation. And I think the other is level of involvement um, in the particular investment. So when we talk about job creation for your own business or a friend's business, what we're talking about is a requirement that that particular business create 10 jobs for Harry, Joe, Sally, Robert, et cetera. They have to be real people that are employed by that business that you can produce I-9s for, W-2s for, payroll records, tax filings, a whole host of evidence um, in order to show that you've actually created the requisite number of jobs. When you're talking about job creation in the regional center context, while there is a direct employment component, what we're more likely talking about is indirect employment and induced employment, um, which is uh, employment that's created by things like spending money in the economy or the fact that the business might generate revenues. And what you're allowed to do is count jobs that create by virtue of, by virtue of those expenditures and those revenues. And you determine job creation using a multiplier effect, um, an economic methodology, if you will. And so that results in a couple of things. One is I think it's easier documentation generally to obtain. And um, as was mentioned earlier, it's in this case, if you do an investment through a regional center such as Can-Am, they're providing you all of that evidence at the end of the day, um, meaning you're not responsible for getting W-2s and I-9s for Harry, Joe, and Sally. Instead, you're presented with evidence of job creation by virtue of expenditure evidence, revenue evidence, et cetera. Um, and then the second thing that I mentioned was level of involvement. Um, if you are doing your own business, of course, you are probably necessarily going to be involved on a high level, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which might be desirable to some people, um, but it also means that, um, you know, your, your uh, energies are directed there in terms of trying to make sure the business succeeds, trying to make sure you get enough employees. Um, whereas if you invest through a regional center, it's really um, more of a passive investment um, where you want to monitor your investment, um, but the evidence um, and making sure that the investment is on target are done by a third party for you. Um, and certainly, if you go that route, that doesn't necessarily preclude you from then doing your own business um, currently while you have a conditional green card. Um, but it just um, allows you a greater degree, perhaps, of comfort, if you will, in terms of job creation um, and oversight of the investment. 
You know, it's been my observation that people from anywhere who decide to do EB-5 have one overwhelming priority, and that is to get the green card and keep it. And if you asked, if you really parsed it out, you could say, okay, what are your top five priorities in descending order of importance. Number one, get the green card and keep it. Number two, get the green card and keep it. Number three, get the green card and keep it. Number four, get my money, my capital back in some reasonable period of time. And number five, and way down the list, when you really, really get at it, is some kind of, you know, some big time return on capital or any return on capital. I mean, it'd be nice, but it is not the real force when somebody has decided that they want to put some money into EB-5. If you want to make money, you know, go put it in something else. If you, if you want to make return on investment. If you want safety, then find a really good regional center-based investment. And here's why that works that way. One is this idea of getting to count the trickle-down and trickle-up jobs. That's what that regional center involvement legally allows is being able to count the indirect jobs that trickle down and trickle up from the business. The other thing is a surprisingly generous interpretation that the Immigration Service has made that you can count the investors in, in a pooled investment deal where a big project is being built can count the indirect and maybe even direct jobs that result as an impact of the construction. And most EB-5, most big EB-5 deals involve some big construction project. And the reason that is so positive is because as long as the developer just spends your money in EB-5 and whatever other money there may be, which may be a big bank loan or other equity, and the, uh, the Immigration Service surprisingly lets the EB-5 investors take all the job credit from all that money. I guess on the theory that this key equity begets the other financing that makes this all possible. But that means that all the developer has to do is spend the money to build the thing, and the jobs are deemed created that make sure you get to keep your green card. Now, you still want your money back, and that's something to evaluate um, and to compare other, the, the different projects. But this idea of being able to count the jobs, even if the project is not operationally a big success, is big in terms of immigration risk and reducing that immigration risk, making sure you get to keep that green part. Um, three major advantages of uh, filing a regional center petition over a direct EB-5 petition is that one, going in you know how much capital you're investing. A regional center cannot turn around and ask you for more money if the project's not doing well. But if it's your business, you'll obviously pump in more money. Secondly, regional centers usually have a buffer of uh, anywhere from 20 to 100 percent of job creation. So whereas we need to create 10 jobs per investor, we usually off late, we've been creating 20 jobs per investor. So that safeguards your immigration goals. So, I mean, these are the two main advantages. And third is that it can be a project anywhere in the United States, and you have the freedom to live and work anywhere else, whereas if it's your own business, you will be stuck to that particular geography. So. Great, thank you. So I'd like to move on to, to just to take a chance to step back, and now that we've talked a little bit about the EB-5 visa and some of the requirements that, that you need to go forward with it, to kind of define some of the, the parties that you would be dealing with in this transaction. Um, Abi had kind of alluded to it to the first set that one of the first and most important steps that you're going to need in terms of, of moving forward with an EB-5 investment is to, to speak to a lawyer about it, is to have your, your outside counsel that, that's going to help you to move forward. So, so maybe, Crystal, you could talk a little bit about you know, the, the, 
the role that an attorney would, would play in this. Because we do hear this sometimes that people will just say, oh, well, I'll just fill out my petition. I'll fill out my I-526 myself. I, I, I can do that, and then I'll just do the investment. So, so maybe speak on how that would be a bad idea or, or not a feasible notion at all. Well, I don't consider myself totally indispensable. Um, I, think, I suppose some, some people do successfully go through the process on their own, but um, I think probably at the end of the day, um, it is advisable to secure counsel before moving forward with EB-5 or any immigration option, really. Um, and that's really tied to the complexity of the process. Um, as we heard earlier, there's three main steps in the process, the first of which is the filing of the I-526 petition, which is the eligibility petition. It says you're qualified to apply for a green card in the EB-5 category. Um, and as we heard earlier, there's two main parts to that particular filing. One is related to the project that you invest in, um, and the other half is related to your investment capital. Um, now, a lot of people, I think, under, are under a misconception, really, when we tell them that you need to document the lawful source of your investment capital. They think, oh, well, I've, you know, I've worked for 50 years. Um, you know, surely I can just say, you know, provide my tax returns or whatever the case may be, and the Immigration Service will understand that I've lawfully acquired that capital. Um, and that's just not the case, unfortunately. I wish it were. When we say you need to document the lawful source of your, of your investment capital, what we really mean is the lawful source and path. Um, when I think of how the Immigration Service reviews your source of funds documentation, I think of it as a forensic accounting, if you will. Um, meaning the Immigration Service essentially takes the position that money is not fungible and that every dollar that you invest is marked with a red marker. And you need to trace it back from your receipt of it back to its source. So if you earned your capital from lawful employment, what you would need to show is not only just that you were lawfully employed, but you would need to show your receipt of all of that salary, meaning bank statements, showing every deposit of that income into your account. Um, and you would need to show that it accumulated in that account. Um, and let's be real, most people don't just put their money in an account and let it accumulate. Um, that's just not how, how we usually manage our money. Um, so that's actually, contrary to popular belief, a, a very difficult source of capital to document. Um, and I'm not saying we can't do that, but what an attorney really does with you is to not only help you document your investment capital, but to work with you to strategize about what is the best possible source that you could use. For example, we usually advise people that large asset transactions are much better than earned income. Mortgaging your house, taking a loan from your company, selling a piece of property, things where you might get a large chunk of change at once are easier to document to the satisfaction of the immigration service. So we would help work with you to strategize about how we would put together your source of funds. Um, in addition, while this is an investment and therefore neither Robert nor I nor any immigration attorney could advise you on the specifics of the investment, meaning the other half of that petition, um, what we can do is review project documents and ensure, give you some peace of mind that they comply with immigration requirements. Um, so really there's a, a dual role that we would work with you on at that particular stage of the process. Um, and and then, of course, down the road, when you're actually applying for the green cards, you know, immigration attorneys work with you in the same manner that, you know, you might in, like, the I-140 context, looking at things like inadmissibility, et cetera. Um, so I, you know, again, it's possible that you could go through the process on your own, but um, I do think that there's definitely value in at least consulting with an immigration attorney. Um, add to that, it's not only about U.S. laws. Uh, if your funds are originating in a country outside of the United States, you have to be compliant with the laws of that country. Like, for instance, if your funds are in India and uh, you're selling a property there, it has to be compliant 
under Indian laws, and then the remittance needs to be in accordance with the liberalized remittance scheme of the Reserve Bank of India. So it's a very involved process, and if, if it goes wrong, it can not only go wrong here in United States where you don't get your green card, but you can also be charged with penalties. Like if you violate LRS uh, regulations in India, the penalty is 300% of the amount you remitted outside of India. So you have to be really careful about that. Just while we're talking about this source of funds thing, I think that it can sound pretty intimidating, and it should. It is demanding. But we know that in real life, there are situations where it is not possible to document every single step of every dollar or every rupee or whatever that made its way into the investment. And a lot of times we work with people to fill those gaps with other types of evidence that show that it's likely uh, that that step did not involve injecting some drug trafficking proceeds into the process, which is really what's going on here. You're really, you're trying to, sh you're proving a negative that this was not illegally obtained. And the way you're proving that is to show, well, where did it come from? What legitimate sources did it come from? Now you do have, you say, if you sell a big piece of property, you still have to try to show where did you get the money to buy that property in the first place? Because that could be drug money that you used to buy it, that you now sold. Um, so it has to go back uh, a good bit. People have come up with some incredibly detailed strategies that come from a, an amalgamation of sources. I mean, I may have, you know, 100,000 in cash here. I've got some other asset over here I'm gonna liquidate. I've got a cousin who's gonna give me some money. I've got, you know, and then I gotta show, if, if I get some money from somebody else, I've gotta show where did they get that money? And, um, and, and it, it can be complicated. I had one source, one client, uh, my all-star client from India, who pieced, who, we documented 17 different sources of that $500,000. And we, thank God we just got an approval of that case uh, last week. Uh, but it, so it, 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 it can be daunting. I think maybe the best thing that the lawyer does is just provide a, um, you know, a, a demanding review of the documents and make you walk through the process of showing where did this really come from. And my attitude is, I want a package that we file to be something that an adjudicator can open up and look at it and think, I have a good sense of confidence about where this money came from. I'm not the least bit worried that this money came from some illegal activity. And I'm happy for this person to live in this country. Um, you know, that's the impression you want. And if you have a bunch of holes in what you file first, it's my experience, having been on both sides of this thing, the adjudicator goes into skeptical mode. And then they apply that skepticism to everything. And where they might have given you a break on this issue and that issue, they start applying the, the hyper skepticism to all of it. So doing a really good job on the front end is, is very important in my opinion. And maybe Nilesh can uh, shed some light on how it, was it for you as an EB-5 investor, how involved was the process for you? Yeah, you know, I was in a position very similar to most of you. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert in EB-5 like the rest of the people on the panel. And, uh, but I was lucky I had Canam as my regional center and Abhi as my attorney. So let me tell you one thing when you hear all this it sounds very complicated and um, difficult but trust me it's very smooth and simple um, it for me the process was far more pleasant uh, it's not as onerous and daunting as uh, these people are making out to be trust me i'm a live example i if if i had attended a seminar like this uh, before i did ev5 even i would be wondering so, but it, it's very smooth and uh, thanks to people like Abhi and uh, people in Canem, uh, my experience was very, very smooth. 
but yes, one thing I'll say that uh, your sources of fund has to be documented very well. And it's a responsibility that the investor has to take on himself. Uh, it's very nice to engage with attorneys and give them the job to do it. But each one of you, when you plan to do this, uh, take ownership of uh, the entire process. Uh, you know, the documentation, the taxation decisions, the accounting decisions, they all are important. So it's important to solve them as you go along and not just wait that one fine day it'll all uh, become okay. Yeah, thanks, Abhi. <laughs> Didn't mean to step on our next uh, our next topic. Uh, we were, we I, I had uh, poor Nilesh was sitting here waiting for us. We we were we were on our way getting there. Um, uh, one thing I did want to uh, just take a quick step back to to kind of talk about was you know when we're talking about the, the different counterparties in an EB five investment because we, we heard from, from Crystal and Robert to, to the many things that an attorney would be accomplishing for you. But I also want to maybe let Abhi describe for a little bit the different things that a, a regional center would, would be doing in their part of this, because we, we talked a little bit about the difference between a regional center investment and a direct investment. And, and that's not to say when, when just, Abhi, why don't you give us a sense of, of, the, of the different things that are being done by the regional center. Right. So, uh, common perception is that regional centers just put out projects, raise capital, and uh, earn money. Uh, there's a lot that goes uh, goes on in the background, um, even before the project is introduced in the market. Um, we do months, if not years, of due diligence on the developer, on the project itself, the feasibility, uh, because you know. Uh, end of the day, we are putting our goodwill on the line with every project. So uh, in terms of due diligence, we look at whether the de developer has defaulted or not in the past, or any of the projects have stalled or not. Uh, what's the job creation buffer? Because we don't want to put out a project where we are taking in 100 investors and it's just creating 1,000 jobs. We want at least 1,200 to 1,500 jobs to be created. Uh, and then structuring the entire deal. I mean, we, we are registered with uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, and EB-5 is security, so it has to be compliant not only with immigration law, but also with securities laws. And, um, and then we make sure that we deal with uh, good immigration attorneys, because you as an investor do not want a denial, and neither do we. And uh, in terms of project, you know, we look at we, we have a very mixed class. In the past, we've you know, built shipyards, co-funded shipyards or railroads, but we've also done commercial real estate projects in New York, hotel projects everywhere. So, um, so it is just a matter of what works where, uh, and also about how much money can be raised realistically based on the attitude of the government, based on retrogression. So, while last year or last last year we were comfortable raising 350 million or 250 million dollars for a project, right now we we are putting out smaller projects, uh, being more realistic, and uh, uh, that's one. And then uh, what's and we also have to look at not only if the project is good from an immigration standpoint, but also what sells. Um, for most people outside of the United States, San Francisco and New York are United States. They don't want to look at projects outside of these regions. So, uh, so then we try to put out some good deals, and we have to be cognizant of whether these deals are in targeted employment areas so that our investors qualify under half a million dollar investment category. So there's a lot that goes on. And once we launch a project, then the next step is raise capital, yes, but also make sure that there's a bank that is interested in funding the project. There is an alternate source of funding because what if we are not able to raise EB-5 capital? We don't want the project to stall because um, whatever investors are there, they'll suffer if the project doesn't take off. So that's very important for us. And third is job creation is dependent on economic spending. It is dependent on uh, the progress on the project. So we have a project team that you know is in touch with the developers get quarterly up, gets quarterly updates we personally visit project sites to see the progress on the projects no matter where they are in the united states and uh, so there's a lot that goes on and uh, once the project is done it is our duty to 
give the capital back to our investors. So from scratch to finish, it, it's for us, it's more than a five to seven year uh, uh, cycle. For our investors, yes, they invest. In five to seven years, they get their money back and they're done. But for us, it starts a lot, a uh, long time before that. Great. Thank you, Abhi. So moving on, um, I did. We, we we gave Nilesh a moment to talk about kind of his experience as as an investor going through the EB five program. I just wanted to, to give you just a. Was there any other lasting impressions that you had, or, or any, just any, uh, any sort of roadblocks that you feel like you, you could discuss, or, or that 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 could be helpful or informative to to a potential uh, investor in EB-5? Sure. Um, you know, Abhi just talked about how a regional center functions. Uh, let me talk about a regional center from your perspective as to when you're going to look at a regional center and you're going to evaluate a regional center, how, how should you be doing it? Or rather, let me put it this way, as to how did I go about looking at regional centers? Uh, so, you know, you're essentially boiling, uh, you know, I'm an investor, that's what I do normally, that's what I've been doing for the last 14, 15 years. And one thing which I look at investments is look at the credibility of the people involved. Investments is not about financial numbers or term sheets, it's more about the credibility of the people, uh, what kind of track record they have, or, and can you trust them. Uh, so when I was looking at regional centers, this was the important filtering factor. Uh, and that's where Canem stood out the best because they had the best track record, they were the most transparent, and they had the most uh, credible people to deal with. And I, I'm a great believer in the fact that if you can trust the person, then you do business with him, and then the rest of the terms fall into place. So the first choice is, is, is about making the choice of the right regional center. And for me, that was the easiest choice uh, because I looked at the whole market in terms of the various regional centers that existed at that point of time. The number has only grown after that. And uh, I was surprised that uh, in terms of the quality, there were hardly any which would have done the full circle. So, you know, I looked at project, uh, looked at regional centers which had done the entire stream of things, right from, you know, getting, um, you know, conditional green cards to the repayment of capital. There were a handful of regional centers which had done the full thing and Canem stood out as, as the one which had done, you know, had been doing it for 30 years and projects after projects. Uh, so for me, that was, that established credibility. Uh, also, you know, we I wanted to look at what is known as a repayment track record in terms of saying that, you know, it's fine that did I got my green card, but will I also get my capital back? And even and those parameters, I found Canem as as a regional center which had the best track record of repayment. So, the one of the learnings is the choice of regional center. Uh, the second learning was obviously the choice of the right immigration attorney. Uh, many of you would be uh, on H-1B and would already be dealing with some immigration attorney. Uh, my, you know, but, you know, working with the same attorney for EB-5 may not be the right way of doing it because work with an immigration attorney who has actually done EB-5 in the past. There are literally, literally hundreds of uh, immigration attorneys who have done H-1B, but very few, a handful of few who have done EB-5. And even fewer than that would be the ones who would have done repeatedly. Some of you, you know, some of them are on the panel right now. So work with experience track record uh, in immigration attorneys as well. And the third choice I made was about the project. You know, once you, uh, what, what, what do you really look for in a project? Uh, uh, from my perspective, I was, you know, there are three things. Will I get my green card uh, from this project? Will I get my money back from this project? And will I get both the things back from this project? And uh, that's how you need to look at it. So these were the three choices which I feel, you know, if I were to summarize my learnings as an EB-5 investor, these are the three key choices. Choice of a credible regional center, choice of an experienced immigration attorney, and a project where I am you know, assured of safety of my green card and of my principal. If I were to extend this and by saying what are the three things you should not do, I think one thing which you guys should not do is 
you know, don't use Google search as a source of legal advice. You know, trust me, a lot of people just start Googling things and uh, the best thing to do is to work with an attorney, ask them your questions and clarify doubts. Uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, you know, don't get involved in situations where you get guaranteed returns or guaranteed repayment of capitals. Those are schemes which, you know, I, I stayed away from and I would encourage all of you also to stay away from those. So that's a big no. Um, anything which sounds like a great deal usually is not. Uh, I'm an investor myself, so I, I, I deal, uh, I have been dealing with project proposals you know, for many, many years. And I, I, I can sense uh, when something is too good to be true, you know, there's always a problem. So w what I would like to say is that keep your faith uh, uh, and trust the process. It worked for me. It worked very smoothly for me. Uh, work with credible people. Work with people who have a track record. Uh, work with people who give you the confidence that it's all going to play out well. These would be my learnings uh, about what I shared and what I gleaned from my journey in, 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 in EB-5. Uh, happy to answer any questions that anybody would have at any point of time. Great. Thank you, Nilesh. So we're going to move into our question and answer portion here for a little bit. But um, before we, we kind of open up to you, I think it might be a decent time to, to kind of go over some frequently asked questions that, that we get, uh, being that just because you might be thinking it already, it might be a good chance to get out of it. And, and just to give you a, an opportunity to hear some of the things that, that come up a lot to us. So if it hasn't been something that you've thought of yet, maybe there's something that, that you might want to, to think about and consider. Um, d does anyone want to kick us off with something? You know, I, w one thing I would start with, I guess, is, is you know, Nilesh had made mention of, of some of the, the things to steer clear of, some of the pitfalls that, that you might see in an EB-5 investment. And so maybe I'll, I'll send it over to Crystal. And he said, sometimes someone might guarantee me a return, or someone might guarantee I'm going to get my, my, my returns uh, or my, my funds paid back to me. I mean, that sounds like it would be great, Crystal, if, if that were the case. I mean, is that something that, that you get asked at all? or? And what would you answer to that to that question? Um, so that was a, an apt summary, um, in that you should steer clear certainly of any sort of project that would guarantee you a return of your investment capital. Um, while it does, of course, sound rather dreamy, um, getting a green card and being guaranteed your money back. Um, for immigration purposes, it's actually a bad thing in that you cannot be guaranteed a return of your investment capital. For EB-5 purposes, your money has to be what we call at risk, meaning subject to both gain and loss. So if someone comes and tells you that they are actually guaranteeing that you will get your capital back, that in fact violates immigration requirements and therefore you might get your money back at the end of the day, but you probably wouldn't get a green card, which would obviously defeat the purpose. Um, so good warning um, and do heed it, please. Um, and money cannot be guaranteed in part or full. So I've come across a few projects um, when I travel to India in the state of Gujarat where people have been promised condominiums if they don't get their money back, that, it, that straight away disqualifies you for an EB-5 visa. Yeah, I, I ran away from all of that. <laughs> uh, one thing that gets posed to us every once in a while, so uh, myself, Abhi Nilesh, we work for KM Investor Services, which is the in-house broker-dealer of KM Enterprises. And we do get asked from time to time, well, why, we're talking about an immigration project. Why am I talking about a broker dealer with you? What, why, why would that be a thing? Why would that be necessary? And so despite the fact that, it is a, that EB-5 is a very unique security and that it is immigration linked, it is still no less a security. So with that in mind, there are certain levels of compliance, there are certain levels of, of registration and oversight that is acquired with the SEC, with FINRA, uh, and, and that compliance comes at, at 
three different levels essentially at the, the level of the security or with the issuer when that is initially being put together uh, with the salesperson who was talking to that like say myself Abi Nilesh we are we are fully licensed uh, with FINRA so we have license to to be talking and, and selling securities within the United States it's very transparent you could look on on say FINRA broker check you could see all of our licenses you could see our career in the, in the industry. Um, and there's also a, a level of compliance that's necessary with the individual investor themselves. Uh, there's a lot of suitability that needs to be taken care of, that needs to be assessed before allowing this investor to potentially move forward with this investment. Um, so, so those sorts of things are, are what helps to, there are people that, that might not necessarily view it that way, but uh, it, it's been pretty clearly defined that EB-5 instruments are uh, a security. And so if you, being in the United States, are dealing with someone on an EB-5 investment, that person really should be a broker-dealer because a broker-dealer would be the only one that would be allowed to, to offer to make a sale within the United States to someone who is a, a U.S. person. So if anyone else has a, if, did you want to? Um, so yes, to your point, um, EB-5 is like, literally like mutual funds, our disclosure documents, they're just like all the risks, everything that's involved, it's not, if you read our disclosure documents, you'll probably not do file an EB-5 petition, but we have to disclose everything. And just like shares and other kinds of securities, cannot be sold by people that are not licensed with uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, EB-5 is the same way. So if someone's doing that without having a broker-dealer or being involved with a broker-dealer, the chances are that Securities and Exchange Commission will come after them and find them and maybe shut the regional center down. What that means for you is that you've made the investment, you'll probably not get your green card. Yeah. And then, um, one of the th uh, questions that I get a lot from uh, investors that I meet uh, in U.S. and also overseas is that a lot of time people meet regional centers that tour with uh, an immigration attorney and they offer package deals. So, uh, Robert, I'd like to get your thoughts on that about regional center attorney package deals where regional center is taking care of the immigration attorney in terms of fees. Um, you know, I can't say I know a ton about that because I don't have any relationship like that. Um, I mean, a, I guess uh, a regional center or the, the new commercial enterprise that's selling an investment could encourage people to use a particular council because that regional center feels that that council is particularly good at helping people pull together their applications and that's going to reduce any um, you know denial rate on individualized investor issues that uh, that the the regional center would experience but every investor has their own choice to use whatever lawyer they want um, and um, I mean I, I guess I guess a regional center could I, I see some that say you have to use right. That's an, what I was. You have to. to use an experienced immigration counsel, experienced with EB-5, and they're they're just trying to make sure that you don't get into a big mess filing cruddy papers about where your money comes from and getting denied and causing them a lot of trouble to have to try to figure out a refund you and uh, and and just give their whole thing a bad name. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think those things can be reasonable, um, but um, I, you know, I, I would urge, I, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's my belief that people should make their own relationship with their own lawyer. Right. Yeah. But can attorneys get compensated by regional centers? Now, okay, this is a very, it's not as hot as it once was because this has been very well settled. There, were, there was a period of time where a lot of lawyers apparently, I, I, it's, it blows my mind to think this happened, but it did. 
there were a, a decent number of lawyers who were bringing clients, their, you know, investor clients to uh, regional centers and saying, I will steer investors to you if you pay me a commission. It's literally a kickback. Uh, this is illegal on numerous levels. And the SEC found out about this. They punished the sellers who were u paying those commissions and they punished the lawyers who were taking them. And um, this has, I mean, I mean, it's just clearly wrong. Um, and I mean, I, you know, we, we would never take any kind of commission from anybody. Our loyalty is to the client that we represent. And, and that, the ethical rules of lawyers require that and prohibit any kind of secret commission. But there's securities laws that prohibit that as well because whoever it is that's talking you into any particular investment opportunity, if they're in, especially if they're in the United States, they need to be a registered broker. Great. Um, so I, I kind of want to take a chance before we got too far into this is, is to take some of the questions that, that had been kind of thrown at us from the audience. Um, and if you have some questions, please try to, to go to the back table and send them. Um, Claire has been sending them to me up here so we can try and go through a few of them. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about some of the pitfalls. Someone asked about our denial rate um, in, in terms of, I'm assuming that we're talking about in terms of some of the, the petitions that we discussed, the I-526s, the I-29s. Um, now clearly this is going to be unique to the regional center that you talk to, so I can't really speak to, to everyone in, in terms of that, but as far as we're concerned, um, we've got over 4,500 individual I-526 petitions that have been approved. We have about 20 denials. I you know, apologize in advance if I don't do that math off the top of my head, but it's in a very high range of, of, uh, of approvals uh, compared to denials, obviously. Um, on the I-29 level, we have over 2,200 approvals and I think 10 denials at this point. So, so again, a, a very long um, uh, record of, of, of successful petitions in both of those regards. Um, I think um, one thing that we thought was important that we went through last year is we performed an audit of our track record. Uh, so we had a third party accounting firm go ahead and, and all of those track records to make sure that the validity was was clear and was insured for, for those who were looking at it. So, you know, it, it's an attempt to try to just continue to bring more transparency into this to, to give you a more informed uh, fact set for when you're looking to make a decision. Um, that that would go along with repayment of funds as well. Um, so we, we crossed the billion dollar mark in terms of funds repaid this year. Um, Someone had asked, I guess it's a little bit on the vague um, side. Just one thing, point of clarification with respect to the track record. So there are two ways, I mean, there are two reasons for denials. One is project related and one is individual. That is source of funds, negative immigration history, or a criminal record. So with, when it comes to projects, Canam has not had a denial. Uh, and the denials that Pete referred to were because of investors' personal reasons for not being able to document the source of funds properly or having a travel ban or uh, negative uh, immigration history. Yeah. Uh, we had been asked a question, it was a little bit on the vague side, about government policy changes. Um, I, I don't know, I guess I'll, I'll let Robert kind of try to decipher, decipher that one. Well, there have been periods of time in which the Immigration Service suddenly sprang a new interpretation on the, on the industry. And this is particularly grievous, I think. I mean, it, it's, it, it's very uh, sort of unbusinesslike to change the rules in the middle of the game. There was a point in time where people were particularly using EB-5 money to build commercial buildings and they were counting the job creation of the tenants who were renting space in those buildings. And 
you know, arguably that shouldn't have been allowed from the beginning, but it was. And at some point back in uh, 2011, 12, somewhere in there, the Immigration Service suddenly announced, we're not, we're not gonna give credit for this, quote, tenant occupancy anymore. That's an example of a change. That was abrupt. Uh, I can say that that experience and one other has kind of taught the Immigration Service a lesson and new policies that they have tended to put out trying to shift the interpretation of the EB-5 rules have tended to be announced as a prospective matter. Um, now there's an exception to that. Not too long ago, the Immigration Service suddenly started denying individual investor petitions when the money that was used was loaned to the investor. So the investor got a loan from somebody and then used that, the proceeds of that loan to do their EB-5 investment. And the Immigration Service said, well, no, wait a minute. That can't count and you have to be denied unless you can show that that loan is secured by your personal assets, okay? Now that's not the law, and they took a, they twisted a regulation about something else and, and kind of turned it into that interpretation. Recently, they were sued and they lost. You know, uh, uh, some group of investors who had gotten denied got together brought a lawsuit and won against the government and the judge declared, you know, that was wrong. Um, I think that kind of taught them one more lesson about, uh, you know, changing the rules in the middle of the game. They said, well, that really was always the rule, but we hadn't been uh, maybe enforcing it in all the situations where we could have. But um, it can happen. It shouldn't happen. Um, I think they're kind of over most of their you know, major interpretational shifts. Every once in a while, they will declare that some, some provision in a, in, a, in a project, set of project documents um, violated this rule about at risk and to say that, that it was somehow, uh, uh, that there was an un, inappropriate redemption planned and the rules about that are super complicated, um, and you just need to make sure that you're working with, uh, you're investing in, in a project with a party who has good lawyers who know about these quirky rules and knows how to not put, not go too far in, in these things, just exactly what Crystal was saying a while ago. You know, I've seen, I've seen situations where back when the, you know, in the big heyday of the Chinese investors and the Chinese brokers who were originating all these people and they were kind of advocating on behalf of the group of investors they would, they would be bringing to the table and they would push the seller, the regional center, to add provisions that essentially were kind of guarantees right. for certain things. And ironically, the very things that those agents were pushing for ended up causing denials for all of their investors. And you need um, to make sure that whoever you're investing in, in is counseled by lawyers who understand, you know, kind of this whole fabric of quirky rules and does not, you know, go too far in, in writing these documents. I would just add one thing. Robert actually said to me before we walked up here, he said, well, what are we going to talk about that's new in EB-5? And we, we both sort of agreed that uh, contrary to what might have happened in the past, um, strangely enough, EB-5 seems to be sort of holding a steady course, if you will, in terms of adjudication trends, um, at least in comparison to other categories where we're regularly dealing with RFEs, notices of intent to deny on these novel issues in the H-1B context, in the L-1 context, in the EB-1 context. Um, 
we're, we're sort of had uh, easy sailing, if you will, for a little bit, knock on wood, for EB-5, so. Well, and we're bracing <laughs> ourselves for the possible moment where either Congress or the agency will issue regulations or a law that would change what kind of area can qualify for the half million dollar level versus the million, or that might change the levels from half a million and a million to some higher numbers that might be, you know, the low end closer to a million or something. Um, we keep, I mean, these regulations have been proposed. The agency has the authority to issue them, but they have not issued them yet. It's been two years now since they were proposed on the, as the Obama administration went out the door. The Trump administration has not killed those regulations, but it has not put them out yet. So we don't know if and when that will ever happen. Um, but for now, you know. What I can say is that, you know, I've been looking at EB-5 as an investor since 2012-13, and I've been hearing this, that yeah. things going to change. And, you know, every time there's a new spin to it, but the more I hear it, the more it remains the same. <laughs> I have been impressed with the political ability of the EB-5 industry to prevent, um, you know, radical changes to the rules uh, through legislation or regulation. Um, there, there is a group uh, called IIUSA, Invest in the USA, that um, Can-Am's principal, Tom Rosenfeld, has been very active in over the years, was a, a founding member, I believe, and has been very strong. And particularly that, that organization has, I think, convinced all the people in Congress who might like to change the rules about EB-5 and raise the amount and all that, that any kind of change needs to be prospective. And I have not heard one word, not one breath, from any congressional representative in the last three, four years about the idea of some change that would take effect for people who already invested and filed their I-526. And the proposed regulations from two years ago said the same thing. They would only apply prospectively after, once the regulation, the final regulation was published and I think 60 days had passed, only people who filed after that would be subject to the new rules. Great, and, and one thing I just, just wanted to, to point out before we go, um, we received about 120 questions, which is fantastic. We, we love hearing from everyone. We're not gonna get a chance to answer them all up here today, but um, if you wanna follow Can-Am uh, or on, uh, on LinkedIn or, or Ty on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter, um, we, will, we will get to those questions. And all of the speakers' email addresses are up on the screen now. So if you want to, to take, a, take a screenshot of that or, or take a message, if you want to grab some, one of our business cards up front, we'd be happy to, to get to some of those a little bit later on. Um, a question that came from, from so, so someone actually posed it, Claire had sent this over to me. What is an RFE? It's, it's been, we, we've mentioned that uh, once or twice. What, I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Crystal or, or Robert you said it. <laughs> um, so RFE it stands for Request for Evidence. So when you submit any type of immigration filing, not just um, an I-526 petition, but whether it's your I-140, your H-1B petition, um, the service can do one of a few things. They could approve it, which would be ideal. Um, they could deny it right off the bat, or what's more common is they could issue what's called a request for evidence, or in some cases a slightly more um, severe, if you will, um, request for evidence that we call a notice of intent to deny. And in both the request for evidence and the notice of intent to deny, what the Immigration Service is saying is, we don't believe that you qualify for this immigration benefit um, because we have the following questions. But then if you are able to successfully respond to those questions and provide them with additional evidence, additional narrative, um, then they can move forward and then again, either approve or deny your case, hopefully approval. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. 
Um, another question that came in, uh, what types of projects are generally put together in EB-5? Maybe Abhi or Nilesh, you want to? Sure. Um, so in terms of uh, the project itself, it can, so Canham has done a mixed bag. We've done infrastructure projects. Uh, we funded a utility company. We've uh, done uh, projects like building a biotech lab, commercial towers, hotels, railroads. So it's a mixed bag. And the way we structure it, and usually in the EB-5 industry, there are two ways to structure uh, an investment. One is debt-based, and the other is preferred equity. A uh, majority of the projects are debt-based, where simply we uh, establish a special purpose vehicle, and all the funds go into the escrow account, and from there it's given as a debt to a project with a lock-in of five to seven years. And then the second model is preferred equity, uh, which is newer, uh, where instead of making it a debt, regional centers tend to give preferred equity to, uh, to the EB-5 investors in a project. And um, I feel the upsides of a debt-based model is that there's a creditor's agreement, so there is a, a obligation on the developer to return the capital, whereas in preferred equity cases, you cannot force the developer to return your capital. And, uh, but yeah, these are the two main uh, EB-5 investment structures. I think it's important to clarify that the EB-5 investor legally must be making an equity investment into the entity they invest in. This is usually a spe special purpose entity that is set up just to accumulate those EB-5 investments. And then that entity turns around and either provides, provides the money to the job creating entity either as a loan or as some kind of preferred equity. Um, someone had asked about the fees that go along with an EB-5 investment. Um, I don't think it's necessary to go into the, the specific numbers, but I, I think when coming into an EB-5 investment, there would be an administrative fee that is charged by the regional center. That's something that you would be paying up front. You would be paying an attorney fee as well because you would be having that separate representation as we talked about and how important it is to have that separate representation. Uh, and then you'd be paying USCS filing fees uh, for, for the petitions that you're sending forward. And so that is, are basically the, the upfront fees that you'd be looking at when you're going into an EB-5 investment, as well as obviously the investment amount, which is $500,000 if it's in a targeted employment area. And essentially all of the, of the projects that you'd be looking at would be in a targeted employment area. Um, another way that, um, uh, one other way to speak to, to make note is, is in terms of, of those are your upfront fees that you'd be looking at in terms of how, say, a regional center would be compensated. Uh, that would also come from uh, the, basically the, the difference from what the, the borrower is paying for that financing and what the, the end investor, i.e., one of you, would be receiving on an annual basis. So those are, those are essentially, that, that is, that's something that we would discuss. Uh, very lengthily with you if you wanted to because we're, we're very transparent about all the different portions of the EB-5 investment. And it is an important thing to bring up when you're talking with a regional center to make sure that you're aware of how big that, that compensation is because it is definitely a portion of the, of the investment. It just isn't always one of the things that you're looking at right away because it's not necessarily an upfront cost and it's not necessarily an out-of-pocket type fee that you're paying. It's something that it's basically something, a, a return that, that you would be getting on an annual basis, which would, which would uh, have that, uh, that discrepancy uh, involved. I would just say, if you wanted some sort of figure, just ballpark, in addition to the syndication fee the, uh, or administrative fee, as Pete was mentioning, that you probably want to budget about 30 to 40,000 additional dollars to cover attorney's fees and filing fees throughout the process. <laughs> Thank you all very much for attending and a huge round of applause to our panelists for coming all the way here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.